Hi there everybody, this is David, and happy Saturday, and welcome to New RPG News, where we talk about everything RPG related under the sun. We have a lot of stuff to talk about this week from a brand new Trails game just announced, the Unicorn Overlord, Metaphor News, a new saga, a Unicorn Chronicle, Sega going into the backlog, lots of cool stuff. But first, do before we begin, if you are new to the channel, please be sure that you subscribe for some more news, top 10s, reviews, and rants, as well as hit that like button for the ratio, and also, it is Christmas time and everything like that, holidays are right around the corner, and I have this shirt that is right now for sale up until the end of the month. I have this baseball tee as well as a regular t-shirt. So if you like this shirt and you want to support the channel at the same time and purchase it, please be sure to do so in the video description below. And with that, let's go ahead and start up the news. First up, we have a new trailer for Ayutan Chronicle 100 Heroes. It's a key features trailer. I went over this extensively in its very own video, so if you don't want more details on that, please do look back and find that video I just put it out like the other day. But basically, it was a six minute key features trailer that went over the characters, went over the battle system, terrain features, the strategic battles, the uh, like, um, oh, like the home base and everything else. And I'm just gonna go ahead and read to y'all the description that they gave it. it says prepare for a meticulously crafted turn-based RPG with gorgeous 2D sprites and 3D backgrounds. Create your ideal six character party and choose from more than 100 unique heroes to join you through the war-torn continent of Auron. Manage your town and recruit companions to gather resources, expand production, and develop new facilities to aid in your campaign. Confront foes in strategic one-on-one -on -one duels and intense war battles that will shape your story. This thing is looking to be fan freaking tastic again i went on extensively about this in its very own video i don't want to like rehash all of that here but i do want to let you know that it is coming out on april 23rd we have a release date april 23rd of next year for the ps5 ps4 xbox and pc sega announces a new crazy taxi new golden axe new jet set radio shinobi and streets of rage games guess what these are all old games from sega Guess what? None of them are JRPGs. But <laughs> I am bringing it up because Sega is going back into their old catalog and they are looking at games that they do want to bring out, that they do want to revisit. Um, and we heard a rumor not that long ago, maybe a month or so ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, a rumor that they were going to be remaking or remastering um, Skies of Arcadia, which was a fantastic game. I played it myself over on the GameCube, and I loved it. We haven't heard anything about that since that one rumor, but things might be on the positive spin if they are going back into their catalog and looking at these games. And maybe if these games do do well, then they will look into Skies of Arcadia. They will look into Fantasy Star. They will look into Shining Force. We don't know. All we do know is that they are open to it, they are receptive to it, so I thought that I would go ahead and bring this up. Of these games, I was not a Sega kid, I grew up with a Nintendo, um, but of these games, I have really only played the Golden Axe games, and I really enjoyed the Golden Axe games that I played myself. These other ones I've heard of, haven't really played them though. Final Fantasy XVI development team has been disbanded. This is according to an interview in Sfemitsu, by Yoshi P. Before anybody gets up in arms and like, oh my gosh, it's being disbanded because Final Fantasy 16 was so bad. No, this is normal, people. The game is out. The DLC came out. They're still working on the last piece of DLC. So of course, they're, you know, letting these people keep their jobs. They're not just gonna be like, oh, well you created this great game. We're gonna fire you now, no. They disband the unit and they put them into other units to create other games. This is normal. This is how games are produced. This is just business. This is normal. So I don't want to hear any conspiracy theories about why it's happening. The only group that is still uh, working is the one that is working on the Rising Tide DLC that is due out in the spring. Um, he then goes on to say, that he doesn't expect there to be any kind of fully-fledged sequel game to Final Fantasy XVI in the style of something like Crisis Core, Final Fantasy VII Reunion, or the Final Fantasy XIII sequels, though he isn't ruling anything out. Something tells me that, yeah, the game did sell up to expectations, but it didn't sell beyond expectations, so they're just gonna cut their losses and be like, okay, 16 is its own little thing, now we're gonna move on to 17 and have that be its own little thing as well. That makes the most sense to me. 
Um, but I did think that this little tidbit was interesting. As far as the second DLC expansion called The Rising Tide, it's set to release in spring, like I said. Details are still scarce, but it's going to see Clive and his allies travel to the land of Messidia for an effort confrontation with the water icon known as Leviathan the Lost, who we did hear about in the main game. If you recall, Messidia, it has been in two previous Final Fantasy games. It was in Final Fantasy II, and it was also in Final Fantasy IV. And on Cecil's way to the land of Messidia, he encountered Leviathan. So I do think that this is a really good kind of throwback to that in the same way that the Echoes of the Fallen DLC that we just got was a really cool uh, throwback to Final Fantasy 1 and Final Fantasy 6. So I don't know if they're somehow connecting 16's universe to the to the earlier games in the series, but they've already connected it to 1 and 6. Now it looks like they're connecting it to 2 and 4 as well. So just a little interesting tidbit right there that I thought that I'd bring up. We have a release date for Saga Emerald Beyond, launching on April 25th of next year, just a couple of days after Ayudin Chronicle. Um, the Saga series is hit or miss for me. The last time I really enjoyed a Saga series, like, oh my god, I'm gonna age myself, Final Fantasy Legend 3 on the Game Boy. Like, it has been a hot minute since I have enjoyed a Saga series game. Uh, the ones on the Game Boy, I think, were the best ones, especially Final Fantasy Legend 2. And then it seems like they always just kind of go off on these weirdo directions and weirdo tangents, and it's like they're too ambitious or too weird for their own good. I want to like them because I do have a history with the games, and I've played a lot of them. I've played the Saga Frontiers, I've played the Romancing Sagas, I even played Unlimited Saga, for God's sakes. But I never enjoyed them as much as I did those three games over on the Game Boy. So I am hoping and praying, against all hope, that this one will be just like Final Fantasy Legend 2, my favorite one. Anyway, there are some glimmers of hope here that it might be just as good. Uh, the reason why I say that is because it says travel to 17 unique worlds from the junction. If you recall how Final Fantasy Legend 2 was set up, there was a bunch of different worlds. I want to say there was like 11 different worlds in Final Fantasy Legend 2, and they were each connected by this kind of like outer spacey crystalline area or whatever, uh, which could be kind of the junction, I guess, I suppose. And you would go from world to world to world to world and solve the various problems. And it also says that each world has different cultures and landscapes, which was the same way in Final Fantasy Legend 2. And we all know that Square is also going back to the basics. I talked about this last time, how they're going back to the basics and they're going back to what worked. So hopefully that is what they are doing here. Goes on to say there are six leading characters, all from diverse backgrounds and vastly different goals, set on a journey of five unique story arcs. So six different characters, only five unique story arcs, though. Um, and then it talks about how it has the greatest number of branching plots in the entire series, which is worrisome to me. Sometimes to me, like, that's really overwhelming. You know what I mean? Like, I like to play a game and have the game just tell its proper story. When you have way too many branching paths and plots and things like that, I, like, I personally get overwhelmed, or I end up looking at a guide, and I, like, obsess over it. I'm like, which plot should I do? Should I go this way to go this way to go this way to go this way? You know what I'm saying? And it becomes too much for me, and then it, like, takes me out of the game, and it, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't play games that way, but it is what it is. <laughs> That's just what I end up doing. So I still do hope that this is just kind of a back-to-the-basics Final Fantasy Legend 2 sort of thing. Um, hopefully, but we shall see. Uh, as we do get more information, I will be reporting it to y'all. We have some new details on Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, about the sub-stories, personality stats, and bond levels. It does go into some great detail about the various sub-stories that you can look at, like this UFO taking up a cow, or a chocobo roosting in his hair, kind of like Saws in Final Fantasy XIII or something, but whatever. What I want to talk about is the personality and how that affects combat and it affects your relationship levels and things like that. It says, the personality is a status consisting of six character traits, your compassion, your confidence, your charisma, your kindness, your intellect, and your style. And all of those can be boosted through various sub-stories or the various mini-games 
that are available in the game. As you enhance each personality trait, you will improve his stats and his abilities and gain access to new jobs, as well as being able to interact with more people and unlock new events. So it looks like it's kind of a slow burn. You have to go through these mini games, you have to go through these little side stories and side quests to gain these personality points to then be able to unlock new jobs, to be able to get a little bit further and move on more in uh, Hawaii right there. Then it goes on to talk about the bond level, and apparently, as you get a further bond level, you will unlock like dual techs or dual attacks with your characters. Uh, it says you'll be able to unlock more jobs and abilities and tackle these enemies together the higher your bond level is, which is pretty cool. Then it also says you'll be able to use chain and combo attacks in battle the higher your bond level is as well. It says that you can do walk and talk events where you can chat with your friends and learn things about them and that'll also increase your bonding level. You can have drinks with them, you can play karaoke with them, you can play darts with them, all sorts of different stuff. And as you do, you'll gain those personality stats and oh my gosh guys, I loved Yakuza Like a Dragon and I cannot wait for this to come out January 26th, PS4, PS5, Xbox, and PC. Metaphor Refantasia. We have new details of the setting, the tribes, the prologue, and unique gameplay mechanics. Uh, this article goes very in depth on a lot of different things that I don't really want to talk about because it really gets into some minutia right here. I really do just want to hit the high points. And it talks about here, it says, in the vast realm that it takes place in dangerous animals and mysterious monsters known as humans. Yeah run rampant, making the lands outside the city walls seldom safe. And the assassinations of Eucronia's prince and king have unleashed further chaos and unrest into a kingdom, now without a ruler. We already knew that. I went pretty in-depth on this game and what we knew about it not that long ago. Then it goes into each individual little tribe, all eight of them, and it goes into the various minutia right there. But then it talks about the monstrosities known as humans. <laughs> These are unidentified creatures with bizarre appearances unlike any other known animal. But each one harbors a substantial amount of rampant magra in their systems, prompting them to indiscriminately attack everything around them. Whether generally unintelligent and aggressive, their biology is a mystery, such as their use of magic far too advanced for people to easily handle. Their bodies are robust, and the larger ones are capable of annihilating even entire armies. I think that that's interesting, and it gives us a little bit more uh, details on the battle system as well. We already know that it's a turn-based battle system, but it also has some action um, points in there too. So it says right here, it's a unique battle system evolved from Persona 5, and it combines action and command-based mechanics. The, the command-based mechanics are the core battle system, but if you do run into any kind of lower ranked enemies on the field, you can just kind of like whack them upside the head and that's your action based combat. So it's probably level dependent, almost like, you know, whenever in like Earthbound, whenever you encounter an enemy and you get that green swirl, then you just like beat it up. You know what I mean? You just kill it. Maybe it's something like that. Like if you, if you're like level 50 and you run into like a level 10 monster, you can just hit the A and whack it and just kill it that way instead of having the actual turn-based battle, which is kind of a cool way to help with um, progression and things like that. It also says the realistic daily life mechanics of the Persona series have evolved. Enjoy a realistic daily life experience as if you're actually planning a journey. Travel around the world aboard your gauntlet runner, move between multiple bases, and set off on a worldwide journey. So this does have kind of a social sim aspect into it where you do have to talk and bond events with your characters then in addition atlas is celebrating its 35th anniversary as a company and it's doing a world tour for it we don't have any more details announced about that world tour what they're going to be doing what they're going to be showcasing but it looks to me that this game is in celebration of kind of their 35th anniversary this is coming out for the fall for the PS4, PS5, Xbox, and PC. A new Trails game! The Legend of Heroes Kai no Kiseki Farewell Ozamuria has been announced due out in 2024 in Japan, of course, because we're already two games behind. But whatever, Nisa gave us four freaking games this year in the Trails series. They are doing 
fantastically. I think that we're going to be caught up within like one year, maybe two, and we'll be like getting our simultaneous releases at this point. Like we are really getting caught up with this series. This is the 20th anniversary title in this series, launching for unspecified platforms in Japan of next year. I'm going to just go ahead and read to y'all everything it says here. In the year 120X, 12, 12X? I don't know. In the year, <laughs> everything comes to an end. C. Epstein, the father of the Orbital Revolution, prophesies the end of the Zemurian continent. As X day approaches, a massive orbital rocket is about to be launched from a large military base in the Kunlun Range. Can man make it past the planet's atmosphere? What lies at the end of the continent? Will mankind be able to uncover the true nature of the world? Well, the whole world, world watches to witness the largest undertaking since the dawn of history, somewhere in the singularity that is Ored, that's a, a tiny country to the north, uh, <clears throat> to the north of Calvard and Erebonia. Somewhere in the singularity that is Ored, forces from all over the land were about to gather, including a young Spriggan. Yeah. That's the hero from Kuro which we're getting next summer. Will the single trail towards the distant Hesmets ultimately shape the future of Zemuria, or... So, yeah, we might be getting some, like, outer space stuff going on here. This could be a, this could be, like, a launching point to the next continent. We already know that at this point, uh, the creator has said that we're, like, 75 to 85% of the way through. So, something tells me that this one here could be racking, wrapping up Kuro Koseki, and then the next arc could just be like, okay, that's it, you know, we're gonna put in three games or whatever, and just wrap this stuff up, like, my god, it's been going on for 20-something years. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, they do need to wrap it up. It's been going on for quite a bit of time. It is a great story. If you haven't gotten into this series yet, you really, really need to. It is one of the best ones out there. And I cannot wait to see where this takes us. Are we going into outer space? Are we going to another world? What is happening? Are, are we finally going to be meeting the Grand Master? I don't know. Another Code Recollection demo is now available. This is going to be released worldwide on January 19th of next year. But if you want to go ahead and play the demo and check it out, you can right now on the Switch. This is a point and click adventure game and it's a collection. It's a collection of two games released on the Nintendo DS. We only got one in America called Trace Memory. The other one was only released in Japan, but now we get them both in English. It says, it features two enhanced mystery adventures, including the sequel that was previously unreleased in North America. Uncover the past and find the hidden truths across both games featuring overhauled visuals, fully explorable environments, new voice acting, puzzles, and music. Optional hint and navigation systems have also been added to help players who might be new to adventure games. So if you're excited about this one, be sure to check out the demo and see what it's all about. I personally am not. <laughs> this isn't my type of game, but I know that a lot of y'all do like these, so I just figured, you know what, I'll just bring it to y'all and let you know about it, you know. I'm nice like that. This just looked interesting to me. It looks very SNES retro-y. Looks kind of undertale-y. It also looks like it has that color palette from the Super Game Boy. Remember the default colors from the Super Game Boy back on the SNES? And it was like this weird like orange and purple colors. Remember that? I do because I'm old. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, this is a retro style action RPG Crystal Story Dawn of the Dusk. Releasing for the PC on January 12th of next year. It says that this uh, blends together charming retro style graphics with fast-paced action heavily inspired by 16-bit classics. You'll take on the role of Mina, a young adventurer from the Dawn side who travels to a strange and shattered world called the Dusk side to save her brother who has been kidnapped by the forces of the great demon named Termina. In this episodic series, she grows in the role of a true knight through her adventures and most powerful fire elemental magic called arts. These arts allow her to navigate harsh terrain while battling a shadowy foes that stand in her way. I just thought that this was just kind of neat, kind of old school. It piqued my interest, so I just had to bring it up. And on our final story of the day, a fan-made free-to-play Undertale prequel has been released. In here, you'll be learning the story of Clover, the yellow heart child who fell into Mount Ebbett before Frisk. There's a trailer playing right above. Again, this is absolutely free. This is fan-made. You can go ahead and you can download it and you can play uh, it yourself. It says, Set before the events of the original game, Undertale Yellow lets players step into the shoes of Clover. 
the yellow heart child who plunged at the depth of Mount Ebbett before Frisk. Armed with a cowboy hat and toy gun, this spiritual successor to Undertale invites players to revisit some of the familiar underground locations and explore entirely new areas. In terms of gameplay, Undertale Yellow delivers the classic Undertale experience by combining bullet hell mechanics with the ability to approach encounters with monsters in various ways. While your character's ultimate fate is set in stone by the original game, the journey to that outcome is anything but predetermined. It's introducing three main routes, each offering unique stories and character interactions to explore. It includes other features such as over 100 music tracks featuring new themes and remixes of old favorites. You can get through the game quicker by pressing the RUN button. Why there wasn't a RUN button in the first place is beyond me. You can catch up with your past pals by receiving letters through the mail system, fall down several chasms, exercise your brain by solving all new puzzles, and save and reset with a familiar travel companion. And I actually really enjoyed Undertale and Delta Rune too, from what I played of it. I didn't think that I would. It didn't seem like it was going to be my type of game, you know? But there was like that Earthbound inspired thing, and a lot of other games have taken the combat bullet health turn based thing that they've done and kind of taken that their own route. So I do see how this is a very influential game, and I am going to have to check this out over the holidays coming up. So that's it for this week's news. Hope that all of y'all enjoyed it. Um, I always have a good time presenting the news to y'all. And uh, let me know what you're most interested in. Let me know what stories really resonated with you and all that kind of good stuff. And let me know if you're going to be getting yourself a shirt for the holidays. Let me know. And as always, have a good day. <laughs>